Right, hi everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Right. Uh, let's begin this class with a word of prayer. Uh, welcome to our online students as well. Uh, welcome. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our teaching. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful new day that you have blessed us with, the God. And even as we come together to study and learn your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that that, Lord, you will teach us, you will minister to us, God. Uh, we open our hearts, Lord, to, to receive from you this morning, oh God. We thank you. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last class we looked at chapter 6, uh, Jesus as our teacher. We looked at a lot of examples. We saw that uh, Jesus taught the word of God. Wherever he went, he, he taught uh, parables, he taught life lessons. And, uh, one, and we looked at the nature of the way that the Lord Jesus taught. Right, One was he taught in authority, he taught in love. Yes, so even though there was authority, there was a balance of authority and love. Right, And he characterized his teachings with wisdom. Uh, there was supernatural ministry, meaning he taught uh, and he showed that whatever he's teaching uh, is true and he was able to manifest the supernatural. And the Lord Jesus, very importantly, spoke uh, figurative language. We looked at three things, right? One was metaphors, that is figures of speech. Uh, then we looked at hyperboles, which is exaggerations. And uh, most importantly, he spoke in parables. Um, uh, parables are uh, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And, and we also looked at you know the different kinds of parables that the Lord Jesus spoke in. He spoke, uh, he spoke about forgiveness, generosity, humility, kingdom of God, uh, the judgment of God, prayer, and a lot of these parables were simple earthly parables, but they had great heavenly meaning, right? And so, when we look at teaching, uh, we we can use all of these methods and we can inculcate them in our teaching right so let's go to the next chapter chapter seven and this talks about the teaching that happened in the early church now especially when we look at early church it's the book of acts we know the lord jesus went and uh, he he gave his disciples the commission and he said go make disciples so let's look at the ministry of the teacher in the early church. There are a couple of verses here. Uh, let's read a few of them. Acts 5.42. Maybe one of us can open to Acts 13.1. Right. Acts 5.42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Hmm. Daily in the temple and in houses, they did not cease. They did not stop to teach and preach the word of God. Next one. Acts 13, 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, si Simeon, called Niger, Lu Lucius of Sidon, Manon, who had been brought up with Her Herod, the Tetrarch. Right. Right. So here we see that uh, in, from Jerusalem to the time of Antioch, from the Pentecost to the time of uh, uh, Acts 13, it's almost more than 10 years. Right. And we see that there were teachers already raised up teaching the word of God in the church. Right. And this could be a small setting. Right. This could be a bigger setting. But the ministry of the teacher continued on. Right. Let's go to the next verse. Uh, 1535 and maybe 1811, and then we'll look at the other verses later. 15, Acts 1535. But the Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Yes. So Paul and Barnabas went, and they. this is in the Council of Jerusalem, uh, where he, they went in and they taught the word of God. Yes, go ahead. 1811. 1811. Uh, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius. Huh? 18, uh, Acts 18 was 11. Acts 1811. 
and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Hmm. So Paul is in Corinth now, right? Uh, Acts 18. Uh, before this, Acts 17, he goes to Athens. He's in Greece, right? And we know the whole story that happened there, right? He goes into Aeropagus. He, he says, you know, I see this place is full of temples and uh, there's an idol to an unknown God. He preaches to them. And many people become believers there. And from there, he goes into Corinth. And Corinth, what does he do? He stays there for one and a half years teaching the word of God. Now, just, just, you know, just picture it. These guys at Corinth were, I would say, 90% of them were Gentiles. Right? 90% of them. So here's a man who knew the law. Right? It was easier for the Apostle Paul to minister to the Jews, right? Why? Because he was a, uh, you know, he was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was a person who could, uh, you know, interpret the law and just related to Jesus. But here he's doing the teaching and preaching to Gentiles. Now just think about this. He has to. He can't go back to Moses and say Moses did this, Abraham did this. They don't care about Moses and Abraham. But he had to preach and teach the gospel, teach them. And we see the fruit of his ministry in Corinth, right? Uh, where people became believers, people, a, a church plant was established in Corinth itself, right? Uh, so we see all through the, the disciples. Now, what has been accounted here is, you know, people like Paul and Peter. But out of this, you know, there would have been many, many, many people who became teachers, right? which is not recorded here, right? What we do know is, for example, Apollos, right? He was a very learned person. And, you know, people say that Apollos and Paul had the same level of understanding or the same level of teaching skills, right? That, that, that they included him in the Corinth. Remember the division in the church? Some say I follow Paul, some say I follow Apollos. That means he was at that level. This is where Paul goes and uh, you know talks to Apollos and says, hey, what you're teaching is the baptism of John, the repentance. But then now there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, teaches him, and Apollos becomes a great teacher. So if you look on all through the book of Acts, there would have been many, many people who would have become great leaders, but may not have mentioned. And the ministry of the teachers would have grown. Right in the book of Acts. So let's read 1 Corinthians 4:17. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. First uh, Corinthians 4:17. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, mm -hmm. who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church right now look at this in acts 17 paul has gone to corinth he's done all the hard work the church has been planted and one and a half years he is there he moves on now many couple of years later he he we know the problem in corinth right there's division there are the gifts of the spirit people are not able to identify how to you know work in those gifts of the spirit and so what does paul say this. Because of all this division, I am sending Timothy, my son, who will do what? He, he doesn't say. He doesn't say who will, uh, you know, uh, make you straight or he will make things right in the church, right? Of course, that was the reason why Timothy was sent. But the main thing was so that he will teach you what you must do, right? So you see the emphasis of teaching. Teaching enables a person to, you know, to choose the right way. What is Paul, uh, sorry, uh, Solomon, David, and if you look at the ministry of David and his son Solomon, David says to Solomon, David, uh, talking about his son, he says, Solomon, don't do the mistakes that I made. Right? You follow God, obey his commands. You will have a long life. Solomon made all the mistakes, right? But he says, to his children, to the people of Israel, don't do the mistakes that I made. God is faithful. God loves you. God has a plan for you. And there's a time for every season. And, and he goes on talking about wisdom, about 
Uh, if you read the whole of Proverbs, it's entirely about teaching. Right? It's words of wisdom. Right? And Solomon is telling his people, don't do the mistakes that I did. In my youth, I made a lot of mistakes. You don't do it. And teaching helps us, right? Imagine we, you know, we, we uh, in, uh, for example, in ministry, if we had somebody who's, you know, always telling us, okay, don't do this. When I did this, this was the mistake that I made. And these were the, you know, the challenges that I faced, right? The circumstances for my mistakes. And so when we have people who are able to input into our lives, there's so much that we can avoid. Yes. Right. And and I, I thank God that at a young age, people began to tell me, especially after joining ministry, OK, you do this, do don't do this. This will work. Uh, and again, God's word that will the Holy Spirit, who's our great teacher, will teach us. Right. So Paul here is sending Timothy to a place which is confusion, which has strife, which has jealousy among believers, but he's going there to teach them. I can just picture what Timothy would be saying. Timothy would have said, okay, I know what's going on here. Sit down. See, this is what God's word says. This is what Jesus did. This is how we must live our life. This is how it is. And he probably stayed on and taught them day after day after day. Right? See, right now, all of us, uh, most of us, all of you, you finished one year. Now, if you look back from the time you have joined, have you grown in the word? Definitely. Is there a scale, measurement scale? No. You can't measure that, but you know this teachings have gone in, some of them, and they will bear fruit in your life. Now, in one year down the line, will you be the same? No, because the teachings, not only in Bible college, but also things that you, uh, you know, teachings that you listen online, or preachers and teachings, uh, all of that goes in and makes us uh, to improve the spiritual maturity. We learn, we outgrow certain things, and that's really important. So let's look at some of the instructions uh, of the teaching in the new, in the early church, right? And some of the uh, instructions that God is giving us as teachers, right? We saw the method of teaching last class, right? Love, authority, characterized in wisdom, right? Speaking in parables, uh, figures of speech, hyperboles, uh, speaking in love, uh, making sure that what we teach is true. But now let's look at some of the instructions that God is giving us as teachers. Right. First one, the teaching believer. Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 7. Somebody can also open to Colossians 3.16. Romans 12 and verse 7. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministering. It who he who teaches in teaching. Right. If it is serving let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. Right. So every believer, so Paul is writing here to, again, believers, and he's saying every believer, he's not excluding people. He's saying every believer, if your ministry is serving, serve. If your ministry is teaching, teach. If your ministry is preaching, preach. Whatever your ministry is, do it. Right. Let's go to Colossians 3.16. This is a Familiar verse. Colossians three sixteen. Colossians chapter three verse sixteen. Christ's message is in all its richness. Must live in your hearts. Mm -hmm. Teach and instruct each other with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Yeah. This is a wonderful verse. We often quote it every time. Let me read from the uh, NIV version. It's, it's, it's put out very beautifully. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Right Now, again, these are just believers. But Paul is saying that the word of Christ dwell richly in you that you may teach and admonish one another. Right. So, yes. Always remember, there is the gift, there is the function. All of us can do this. 
Like none of us can say, hey, I, I, I think I'm only, you know, I only want to evangelize. I only want to lead worship. No. If the opportunity comes teaching, all of us as believers can teach. Right? Uh, so every one of us, the teaching believer, the believer God is calling you to teach, teach. It could be a small setting, five people, 10 people, 100 people, 200 people, doesn't matter. Teach the word of God. Two, is the ministry gift of teaching. That's what we are, we are talking about, right? Let's read, uh, uh, we know Ephesians 4.11, but let's read 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. Ephesians 4.11 talks about the fivefold ministry. Uh, but let's read 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 8, 28. Yes, go ahead. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28. <clears throat> And God has placed in the church, first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Yeah. Now, it's very important to understand this verse, right? Many, many of them have asked, why is it that Paul is writing, you know, he's writing your first, first of all apostles, second prophet, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then people who are able to help and serve. Now, remember, it is not, okay, those who are apostles is number one, and then that's the highest rank. In God's kingdom, there is no ranking. Right Now, if we study about the gifts of the Spirit, in no way does it specify that prophecy is better than word of knowledge, or you know, gift of miracles is better than speaking in tongues. No. All gifts are the same, given by one spirit, right? So same thing here. The Apostle Paul is not drawing his attention to, okay, apostles are better than these, than prophets or teachers and then uh, people who are serving in church. But what he's trying to uh, put across is that all of these functions work together. These are different functions working together in the body of Christ, right? So it doesn't mean that this is there's a hierarchy or there's a ranking. No, we can be serving in the church and also prophesy. We can be doing sound and setup in the church and also teach people. You get what I'm saying, right? So there's no hierarchy, right? You know, but somehow, you know, in the church, when we look at the church overall, especially in our nation, uh, we see that there's, oh, there's we, we take people and put them on a pedestal. Oh, he's a prophet. He's an apostle. What are you doing? I'm volunteer. Are you going to stand in the corner? That, that's, that's whose fault? It's our fault. We did that. We have, you know, sometimes when we go to uh, certain places in North India, uh, we get these opportunities. It, they have a genuine heart. Right? They love the pastors. They love, that's good. Honoring the pastors, honoring. But when we overdo it, what will happen? Yep, the person will become a balloon. Right? I'll carry your water bottle. I'll carry your bag. Come, I'll open the door for you. Right? Sorry? <laughs> like a butler. Huh? No, but it's true, you know. And, and you know, when... There are times when we see it, we don't say anything because it's not their fault. It's not the pastor's fault or the prophet's fault. It's our fault, the believers. Yes, we need to respect, we need to love each other, we need to care for each other. But we know how to look after ourselves. We are not, uh, you know, we, we have hands, we have legs, we carry it ourselves. There's nothing wrong, right? But this whole stardom, right? it is our fault. And if you look at in the West, it's not there. Especially if you look at churches, no? Maybe in ministries, like if you look at these uh, great evangelists, it may be there, right? Uh, but there are many places in the West, you know, they don't, they don't everyone are the same. Right? The pastor, the teachers, uh, everyone are the same. And that's the right attitude to have. Right? But there is respect, right? And when we, have the ministry gift of teaching, remember that all of us can build on that. Right? I believe that 
10 years from now when i'm teaching i should be better than what i am now if i'm not then there's something wrong right? i have to improve i have to learn right so sometimes i keep you know i i ask for subjects that i haven't taught right so that i can learn i can study and teach it right? and it's a learning for us as well so the ministry gift of teaching is there for all of us and then there's a function as well right we talked about that as well so so third point do and then ah oh, this one i can talk so much matthew chapter 5 verse 19 let's read matthew 5:19 And somebody can open to Romans 2.21 as well. Matthew 5.19. Mm. Whoever teaches and practices what they teach will be great in the kingdom of God. Right? Let's read Romans. Romans 2 21. Mm. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Mm. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Right. So again, the Apostle Paul is bringing context. He's talking to the believers. He's saying, if you are teaching others, will you not teach yourself? Right? How can you teach others and not do it yourself? Now picture this. Imagine I tell you, each one of you, hey, you know, God's power is inside you. God has given you authority. Go reach out to people. Just share the gospel with people. People will accept the Lord. Don't worry about how you look, how you speak. You know, go do it. God will speak uh, to their lives and touch their lives. Right? Imagine I tell you that, but I don't do anything. Now, you may not know, right, whether I'm doing or no. But what will happen is the scriptures say, am I teaching myself? If I'm teaching others, I must be able to teach myself. Later on, Paul says, I don't want to be preaching and teaching lest I myself be disqualified from the gospel. Right? So when we are teaching, make sure that we do it. Right? If we are teaching about uh, prayer and intercession, about prayer, hey, we have to pray. God answers prayers. Pray big prayers. Are we doing it in our lives? If we are talking about faith, hey, faith can move mountains. Don't worry about the problems that come. Are we walking in faith first? Because it's easy for me to say, but to practically do, it may be very challenging. Yes or no? Right? That's true. So do and then teach. Teach and then do as well. Right? Very important. Next one. Do not teach the commandments of men. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. Matthew 15, verse 9. Matthew 15, 9. And in vain... They worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Mm. Now, if you look at the context of this, Jesus, uh, some Pharisees came to Jesus and uh, said, Hey, you are breaking the tradition. You are breaking the law. What is tradition? Tradition is something that has gone on from years, from generations to generation to generation. One of the traditions that we had with growing up was, my parents said, Night before sleeping, we have to all sit together, sing two songs, read one verse from the Bible, pray and sleep. That is a why I don't know. We have to do it. It's tradition. My my dad, my dad's parents did it, their parents did it, it just came down. Of course, we know it's a blessing, but for me as a young boy, I didn't know. Right. Oh man, by the time it's 8 p.m., oh, it's prayer time. And so we knew. You can't say, I have fever, I have cold. No, no. And they knew that you, my, my parents were like, You do whatever sin. I know what all wrong things you all are doing, but you all are going to sit for the prayer. 
that was a set deal right my parents would our parents wouldn't stop us from going out meeting friends staying over at friends house they would never stop us we were three boys they gave us all the freedom 8 pm you have to sit for prayer you don't tell me any don't give me any excuse and we had that thing in our heart it's a tradition now did they, did those prayers help me at that time no because i was falling asleep half the time it was tradition right it, it didn't okay song song was good okay we'll sing a few songs okay that was good but they will read the verse okay read read something all of us will take turns three of us take turns read and then the prayer starts oh god when will this prayer get over and suddenly amen okay amen <laughs> right now it was tradition jesus is telling the disciples you people are going to the temple they are standing there oh father god you are great you took out moses from egypt you you did you called elisha you called they going on saying the same thing tradition now jesus is saying you all are going there you are worshiping but it's all out of tradition there is no heart involved right it's all just because your fathers did it you are doing it now so he's saying here they worship me in vain their teachings are but rules taught by men right so the pharisees and the sadducees says when you stand you should stand in this posture when you give the offering you, both your hands should be outside forget about heart the way you stand is important right you should wear this kind of dress Right. the lamp should be like this the heart that's okay let it be somewhere else one well, this should be right traditions correctly right it's like uh, what we have now christmas what is christmas now <laughs> christmas tree christmas yeah parties carols chocolates yeah now gifts yeah what else see all of us know nobody saying jesus <laughs> right it's true right many times there are people uh, who are neighbors they put up a star and i know they are not christians i said why you put up the why you put up the star i've gone to, i've asked them why why do you put up christmas so what is christmas it's a star we make donuts a shaped out of star i said that's what you think christmas is tradition and they have a christmas tree also with some empty boxes down why tradition what is a christmas tree i don't know what it is it's tradition right but you know when christmas when i became a believer christmas was so much more than new clothes christmas tree donuts and all these gifts so much more i realized who came into this world right everything changes christmas yeah it's a it's a time of in, enjoying we we rejoice we thank god but when we look at tradition christmas is you know just lost its value so jesus is saying here maybe all your sacrifices all the offerings that you're doing has lost its value do not teach the commandments of men but teach the commandments of god now if you turn it around the teachings that we have now is is there's so much of false teachings it's there on the last point here also so much of teachings that are going on which is commandments of men right <clears throat> there's a clipping i saw i forget who's this preacher but it's a clipping and in the clipping the the preacher says i hope i get this right right the preacher says if your child meets with an accident right and you have to take the child to the hospital what will you do you'll make him sit in the car and you'll drive and on when you're driving you see those uh, speed limits for example it's 30 kilometers per hour so will those speed limits matter when your child is needs to be rushed to the hospital will it matter or no it won't matter because your child is more important than the speed limit true right and he goes on to say the same way God the Father broke the law by sending His Son. Now, when I heard that the first time, I didn't know what to do. I said, "See, the 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 example used was, but you cannot connect it to this. Did God break the law? 
will God break the law? It's simple. But he said, God broke the law. Now, it sounds correct. Does it sound nice? It sounds very nice. It sounds, yeah, yeah. As a father, I will not look at that. I will go 100 to reach the hospital as soon as I can. So here, God broke the law by sending his son. So it became, the, the moment I heard that, right, I knew, OK, God, this is not right. Something's wrong here. So like that, there are many. Another teaching I heard was, um, I'm just sharing these so that we understand what's happening, right? And be aware of these teachings. Now, another teaching was, uh, uh, you know, the, the you know the story of the good Samaritan, right? Uh, the man came on the donkey. So, another teaching was the the donkey is the church, and the donkey's legs are the four pillars of the church. And those who are broken and bruised and beaten can sit on the donkey and God, the, the church will take them to a place where they can be healed. Okay, now why did Jesus tell the story? He was trying to bring a point. But you see how the teaching goes. So, do not teach commandments of men. When you're unsure, the problem is, uh, the problem is when we don't know what to say or what to teach, we run out of ideas, we come up with our own ideas. Now, we can never run out of ideas from the Bible. This ideas will keep going, revelations will keep coming till Jesus comes. It will be there. None of us can say, I don't know what to preach. Preach the same thing again. It's okay. Right? There will be some kind of revelation. Yes. Go ahead. About this do and te then teach. Uh, when we when we are taking this about these preachers who who teach and preach, so uh, in James it, it will be mentioned like there is a judgment for the the people who preach twice or the judgment. How it actually? Uh, oh, like how? Uh, why is there a yeah? So see the thing is, one is there is a regular judgment right that we have. We will all stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ. But then there is also what we have done as, as uh, ministers of God. Our works will be tested, right? So for example, I have preached a sermon, but at the end of the sermon, I everyone came and said, oh, you preached so well. And if in some way there was you know, pride, that'll be a zero because it'll burn. God will burn it, right? So there is this additional, uh, 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 it's not like, okay, you finished your one judgment, come, you have one more judgment now. Go back to the line and stand. It's not like that. So when you're standing in front of the judgment seat, God will open the books. So he'll say, okay, in your personal life, this is what you've done. So for example, somebody has been in the workplace all his life. Right? So, okay, in the workplace, this is what you've done. Now, uh, for example, a, a pastor, for 50 years, he was a pastor. Okay. In your personal life, this is what you've done. You've looked after your family. You've been faithful. This is your ministry. Let's test your ministry. This is what you've done. Right? So it's not like two separate judgments. God is going to see everything, every area. He's going to test it. Right? So. All right, next one. Jesus says, go and teach all nations, all things. Matthew 28, we know the Great Commission. Uh, let's read that, Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And oh, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, the interesting part is many of us quote Matthew 28, 19 and stop there. What is 19? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't end there. What does Jesus say? And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Obedience. You know, I was listening to a sermon uh, yesterday by a very wonderful teacher. And he was saying something. Why is it that some believers, they keep praying, right? They keep praying for years and years and years, but they don't receive what they've been praying for. Now, God says, ask, it shall be given. Yes, of course, God has his timing. God knows 
He's got things. He knows when to give, how to give. But maybe a simple thing. They've been praying for years. Why is it that they don't receive it? They have, they've been praying for it. The problem is there are certain things in life that they have not been obedient to God's word. Obedience is a key to receiving from God. We can pray the whole day. And if we are disobedient, what's going to happen? There's a hindrance. right? Or we can be very obedient and not pray. Right? So we must be able to balance this out. Jesus is saying, go make disciples, teaching them to start churches and ministries. Is he saying that? Teaching them to have start Bible colleges. No. Teaching them to be obedient to what I have commanded you to do. Obedience is a very important key. Right? It, is, it is a very, very important key. Uh, it unlocks things in our lives. It unlocks opportunities. It unlocks great things that God can do for us. Right? Well, and I, I can I have so many examples in my life. I thank God. It was very hard to be obedient at that time. I, I remember as a Bible college student, uh, I think the rule was 5 o'clock that time, 5 a.m. Is it the rule now also? 5 a.m.? Wake up in the morning? 5.30? Okay, it was 5 a.m. before. So we used to wake up at uh, 5. And I had a very good classmate, one guy. I used to only talk to one guy <laughs> in my entire class. And so we would we were really, you know, he was very passionate uh, and he wanted to learn, uh, you know, English. Yeah. No, this is another person. So he wanted to learn English. So we would, you know, and he was very passionate about prayer. I, I learned a lot about prayer from him, right? Because he would wake up, he would pray and he was so passionate about prayer, uh, very focused in his prayer. And so uh, we used to get up at 5 a.m. and pray. Then I remember one day, God just ministered and said, uh, like, are you satisfied with this? I said, no, not satisfied. I want more of you, God. Okay, you wake up at 4 a.m. I just knew. And I think God is just teaching me. So I told my friend, hey, shall we wake up at 4 a.m.? He said, let's do it. So we used to get up at 4, 4 a.m. in the hostel. And we used to, we didn't care whether we're making sound and all. We did whatever we felt like. We started singing loudly, praying loudly. And then... We saw what, what what used to happen was there was this next to our house, next to the hostel that we were staying in. There were these people who were, uh, you know, four o'clock, they would get up and they would pray. Uh, they were not believers, but they would pray to their gods and they would pray really loud, ringing the bell. I said, oh man, we should get up before them. Because if we get up before them, first prayer should go to Jesus in this area. Then others. So set the alarm at 3 a.m. So 3 a.m. we used to get up. Three, three to five, we used to pray. Then five o'clock, everyone used to get up. And then again, we used to all pray together. But I thank God for those days. I thank God for, was it easy? No. Our, the, the warden who was there, he was only fast asleep. But, but nobody was there for us to tell us, okay, get up. You do this, do that. Nobody was there. Uh, we could have got up at seven o'clock, get ready and come to oh, you know Bible call. Nobody will ask us anything, right? Because we were, you know, we were. I was little elderly in my batch. All of them were twenty. Uh, so they never ask us anything. We can do anything we want. I could go out, <laughs> do anything. But there was a choice of being obedient. Did I like the rules? I didn't like some of the rules at all because I came from a corporate office right i've been working in the corporate sector i know how the corporate is suddenly there are rules now uh, for me it was very difficult but obedient is important obedience unlocks things in our life unlocks opportunities and god begins to speak blessings into our life that is why in first samuel what does saul you know samuel say obedience is better than your sacrifice it unlocks and so, so it may be things that I'm not only talking about hostile rules, but I'm talking about anything. God may say, go here, do this, do that. He may put in your heart to read something or read the portion of scriptures or spend more time in prayer. Be obedient to that. Right? The fruit may not be immediate, but the fruit will come. 
it will come right obedience will lead to blessings always right next one the holy spirit is our teacher john 14 26 john 14 26 john 14 26 but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that i said to you amen the best teacher that you and i can have is who the holy spirit he's the greatest teacher we can always go to him if we don't understand something we can go to the go in prayer ask the holy spirit holy spirit i didn't understand this eschatology or oh, able to understand and he he reveals in pieces he will teach us he will guide us right he's the best teacher that you and i can have teach with this wisdom of the spirit first corinthians 2 13 first corinthians 2 13 first corinthians 2 13 these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the holy spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual so paul is saying the things that we have been teaching and are teaching now it has not been taught in man's wisdom. Did Apostle Paul have wisdom? Definitely. Did his team members, Timothy, Silas, all of these people have wisdom? Apollos, they all would have had the wisdom of God. Wisdom on their own. But he's saying it is not the wisdom of man that we are teaching, but it is the wisdom of God. Teach with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We saw the example of how Jesus you know, taught and he was able to articulate people's questions and uh, trying to people trying to trap him. He was able to He knew how to put things across. Right now, here's another thing: we may be wonderful teachers, wonderful preachers, but we must also know how to be in wisdom. Right now, let me give you this example. Uh, uh, one example is you know I, I remember uh, seeing these videos. People usually send it where the pastors are very wonderful leaders, right? powerful, full of wisdom. And on a Sunday morning, what's happened is, I think somebody sent me this clip, or I saw it somewhere, I don't remember, but this pastor gets, it happened in the West, right? Not in here. The pastor gets very angry during the sermon. Why? Because he sees in the congregation, many families didn't come to church, right? So he started naming the families, this family, that these are the families that didn't come to church. What is the reason that you didn't come to church? I want you all to give me an answer now. He was He's a wonderful man of God, full of wisdom. God has given him the ability to teach and preach and very wonderful. But that day, maybe he was having a bad day, right? Or he was just upset, tired, stressed out. But what happened? He let it out. And, you know, it became a big problem. People asked him, why did you have to do that? We have other things. We, we, were, we were busy or we were probably traveling without knowing how can you say, how can you name the people who didn't come to the church? And it became a problem. Later, he apologized because they forgave him and all of that. But then it was not required for all of this to happen. Right. So uh, when we teach, teach with the wisdom of, spirit, of the spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Right? Uh, it could be in the natural also, natural things that we say. It's very important. You know, remember that, you know, as a pastor, what happens is church members, they come up to us and say, sometimes we think that, oh, they may not be listening to me. But they come up and they say, Pastor, you said like this. Tell me what does that mean? Right? And sometimes I keep quoting these books that I read. And I say, this is the book that I read. And they message and ask, what is, where, where can I get that book? Which portion, which chapter was it you're talking about? So, you know, they, they grasp. So anything that we say is, is important because people are grasping it. Right? Teach with the wisdom of the Spirit. Right? Uh, we'll stop here and we'll pick up from our next class. We'll just make a mark here. Uh, right? Teach from the wisdom of the Spirit. Right? Right, so we'll pick up from the next class and we'll see because there's a lot of explanation that we can do. We can discuss as well in the other points. So we'll take some time and uh, you know study that together. Right? Any questions?
from what we have done so far. Right? And when it comes to teaching in the wisdom of the spirit, over time we learn, right? Uh, just like any anything that we do, uh, over time we learn how to answer questions. We will learn how to, you know, give examples. Uh, we will learn how to when to give examples, how to give exa what example is required, right? <clears throat> because uh, you know there was this one time I was I was preaching, and after the whole sermon, uh, you know, I, while going back home, I, I I thought to myself, why did I give that example? In the message, so I went back. I opened the sermon notes, and I looked at it. And I said that example was not even related to what I was saying. Right, and so over time, we learn. Okay, put the right example in the right place, and it's an ongoing process. Right, uh, whether it's preaching, teaching, uh, we learn continually. All right, okay. Let's close uh, with a word of prayer, and then we will meet uh, next week. Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity, Lord, and everything that we are, we have learned and we're going to learn, Lord, as students of your word. We pray, God, that you will continue, Lord, to speak and minister to each of our hearts, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you've called each one of us to preach, to teach. Lord, I pray that you will empower us, equip us, fill us with your wisdom, your revelation, O oh God. May the gifts of the Holy Spirit be released in and through us. And help us, Lord, to make an impact wherever we go and whatever we do, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord, to build your kingdom, God. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone online. Uh, have a blessed day ahead. God bless.